It is good to be with you, uh, grateful for the opportunity and the privilege to come and uh, worship, fellowship, and bring God's word uh, to you. Thank you uh, to the team here uh, for inviting, inviting me. We're going to be in Romans 8, and particularly focusing on verse 31 through to 39. And as you are turning there, uh, I, I just want to uh, put something out of the way. Um, you will soon notice that uh, my uh, pronunciation of certain words will be different from how you uh, pronounce them here. Uh, I, I just just want to assure you that the way I pronounce them is the correct way. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, I am God's instrument uh, to, to help you pronounce some of these words the right way. All right, now that I've put you off, let's read Romans 8, beginning at verse 31. What shall we say to these things? And the question we should ask there is, what things is Paul talking about? Well, it's primarily the uh, things he's immediately said uh, in the preceding verses. But, but there's also a sense in which it's the things he's been saying from the very beginning. Paul is writing Romans to explain to the believers at Rome the uh, righteousness of God in justifying sinners. And the question is, how does God uh, remain just when he justifies sinners? And Paul is going to uh, explain that the answer is, is in the gospel. So he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God um, to bring righteousness to all. And why do we need this gospel? Well, it's because man stands condemned. And so verse 18, he says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against the unrighteousness and ungodliness of, of men who suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. He concludes that section in chapter 3 by saying, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So man stands condemned and is therefore in need of the gospel. And this gospel, he, he, Paul is going to explain from chapter 3, verse 3, that, that you know you are saved by faith, by grace, through faith in Christ Jesus. And, and, and it, is, it is through Christ that we are justified. And it is through Christ and our faith in Christ that a sinner is justified by God and God remains just. And chapter 4, he uh, illustrates justification by faith uh, uh, using Abraham. And then chapter 5 through to chapter 8, he's going to explain the results of this justification by faith. Chapter 5 is that there is reconciliation. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Chapter 6 is that we have freedom. We are uh, liberated from the power of sin. Sin no longer reigns over us, no longer has dominion over us. And then chapter 7, he's going to say we are liberated from the demands of the law because Christ has fulfilled the law. And then in chapter 8, he's going to say, we are secure in Christ. He begins by uh, the chapter by saying, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he ends the chapter by saying, there is no separation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so he says, we know uh, that all things work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he called, he justified. Uh, and ultimately, those whom he called, he glorifies. So what, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we have been killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. At that point, I feel like saying we are dismissed. Paul is saying, those who have union with Christ have assurance of victory in Christ. Those who are in Christ are guaranteed of their security. And he does that by asking a rhetorical question and stating undeniable truths to prove and show the believer's security in Christ Jesus. Question number one, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? The undeniable affirmation there, the undeniable truth is that God is for us. God is for the believers. He, he called them, he keeps them, and he will preserve them till the end. So the question is, if God is for us, who can be against us? The, 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 the point is not that the, no one can be against us, right? Because the believer has enemies. The one who is in Christ has enemies, right? The devil, the world, the flesh. The point being driven at is that there can be no effective opposition to the one who is in Christ Jesus. Because God himself is the protector. God himself is the one who keeps you and watches over you. If you are in Christ, you are in the Father's hand and no one can snatch you out of his, out of his hands. There, there can be no effective opposition. Greater is he that is in the world, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And you know, sometimes we have this Big devil theology. You know, like, 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 uh, like the devil is out to get us and hey, we are in trouble. Uh, like the devil is out to frustrate the plans of God and he's, he's succeeding. You know, it's like, it's like we don't know when we wake up that the devil might actually have God's number. And, you know, we panic and we get anxious. Like, you know, we, we don't know what may happen to our life. And, you know, we may actually be doomed. Oh, no, friends. The one who is in Christ, the sovereign God, is his protector. And no opposition is effective enough to stop God's plans of glorifying you. 
there can be no effective opposition because God himself is the protector. A second question, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The undeniable fact stated negatively, God did not spare his own son. God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gave his only begotten son to die for you and me. Now, I was in the breakout session yesterday, I was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was mentioning to the group that we sometimes think we are actually lovable. Right? Like, God is lucky to have me. You know, like, look at me. Why wouldn't you love me? But oh no, friends. He gave his son for wicked rebels. He did not spare his own son. That's a fact. That's an undi- that's a, the undeniable affirmation. And positively, he delivered him up for us all. So the question is, what can God what can God not give us? And the answer is nothing. There is never a moment, never a time when God deprives us of what we need. You know, it's the argument from the greater to the lesser, right? If, if someone gives you what is most precious to them, they won't hold back anything. We sometimes have a view of God, you know, as this grumpy party pooper who is out to stop us uh, from enjoying life. You know, he, 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 he's like, you know, the typical parent who is constantly saying, no, hey, no, where did you get soap? Yeah, hey, hey, what are you doing? You know, there's silence, hey, hey, where are you, my children? Why are you quiet? <laughs> There is noise. Hey, why are you making noise? Right? Like, and we, we sometimes have that view of God. Like, like God is out there to, to deprive us of, of, of what we need, of good things. No, we know that all things work together for good. For those who love the Lord and those who are called according to his purpose. There is never a moment, never a time that God holds back anything we need. You know, for those who are in Christ Jesus. His, 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 whatever we need to fulfill his purposes and to conform us to the image of his son, he gives us because he gave us his son. He did not hold him back. John Flavio says, how is it imaginable that God should withhold after this spirituals or temporals from his people? How shall we not call them effectively, justify them freely, sanctify them thoroughly, and glorify them eternally? How shall we not clothe them, clothe them, feed them, protect and deliver them? Surely, if he would not spare his own son one stroke, one tear, one groan, one sigh, one circumstance of misery... It can never be imagined that he ever, that he ever should after this deny or withhold from his people for 
whose sex all this was suffered, any mercies, any comforts, any privilege, te- spiritual or temporal, which is good for them. There can be no depriving because God is our provider. Third question. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who is interceding for us? The undeniable truth is that there can be no accusation entertained. And the point again is not that there will be no accusation given because we know the devil is the accuser of the brethren. And in fact, if the devil was to accuse believers, his accusations can actually be true. Right? He could make a solid case against you. But the, so the point is not that there can be no accusation made. The point is that there will be no accusation entertained. Why? Because God is the one who justified you. Christ is the one who died for you. And, 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 and his payment on your behalf appeased and pleased the Father, satisfied the Father's wrath. <laughs> and on top of that, Christ is interceding for you. He is our advocate. That's why we sing, my faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed, I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. We have an advocate. And dear Christian, you need to guard your heart against the... uh, the arrogance of self-sufficiency. You become a Christian for uh, a while, you know, you, you read your Bible and you uh, become comfortable with your works and acts of service and, uh, you, you know, you even read a bit of theology and uh, you, you pick up theological terms and, and you, you know, you begin to think, you know, I'm actually not that bad. <laughs> Right? Then I can actually stand before God and say, Hey, Lord, look at me. Your child, you must be proud. Huh? I mean, my children do that every now and then. They do something, and then they will come and say, Daddy, are you proud of me? <laughs> you know, and my daughter checks in every now and then. She says, Daddy, have we been good? You know, because she feels, hey, it's been a while since, uh, <laughs> you know. And we, 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 we can think, there are times we are tempted to think that we can outgrow our need of Christ. That, that yes, we, we needed Christ to be saved from our sins. But you know, we've graduated. You, you know. That, that, that we actually, we now can stand on our own account. You know, because you know, we've reached a level where we read and understand bathing. <laughs> oh no, friends. We are saved by Christ. We are sustained by Christ. And we are kept to the end by Christ. 
And, and whether you've been a Christian for one day or 10 years or 50 years, guess what? Your stand, your plea is that Christ died and that he died for me. He is our advocate. Fourth question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he lists possible separators. Tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. And, 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 and the point is, for those who are in Christ, there is nothing that can separate them from the love of Christ. They can be assured, they, they can be guaranteed of their security. So shall tribulation, strong outside pressure, distress, inward hardships, persecution, you know, the harassment that comes as a result of our faith, of famine, hunger or poverty, lacking, nakedness, danger, the various physical threats, or even martyrdom. Can any of those things separate us from the love of God, from the love of Christ? Again, Paul is not saying, if you are, if you are in Christ, you are so secure that you will not experience these things. Because again, we can have a view of Christianity. I don't know if you have that song. We have, you know, you know, it's common in most Sunday schools. You know, they sing, we are rolling on, we are rolling on to Zion. You know, you just grab the devil and you stamp on him. We are rolling on to Zion. Oh no, friends. The better theology is it's not an easy road. Because it is a life of hardship. It is a life of tribulation. It is a life of distress. It is a life of persecution. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It is a life of danger. And even possible death. But the point is, you can experience those things. And you will experience those things. But those things are not strong enough to separate you from your God. Because you are secure in Christ. There, there can be no separation. So is there any conceivable power that can prevent the believer From arriving at the ultimate glorification. Is there anything that is powerful enough to stop and prevent the one who has union with Christ from arriving at their glorification in Christ? And the answer is no. Nothing can stop the sovereign God. Nothing can stop and prevent and separate you from Christ and his love. And, and, and it's not because of you and your abilities and your uh, power. It's because of Christ. You know, that's, 
You know, that's a life of poor, isn't it? And Paul understood his security in Christ. That if you actually think about it, Paul was a very difficult guy to persecute. Uh, you beat him up, he rejoices that, that he is counted worthy to suffer for the cause of Christ. You throw him in prison, he says, hey, I am glad to be a prisoner for the sake of the gospel. And then on top of that, he's busy preaching the gospel to the prison guards. You know, so can you imagine being on shift? Hey, you're the one guarding poor today. Yeah, you know, he's going to be hitting you with the gospel. <laughs> so you decide, you know what, let's just kill this guy. And then he says, for me to die is Christ. <laughs> for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. They're like, no, we don't like him. We don't want him to gain. Let's keep him alive. Yeah, if I remain alive, I have greater opportunity to preach Christ. They're like, we don't want him to do that. What do you do with such a guy? Nothing. Why? Because he is in Christ and he knows he's secure. And nothing can separate him from his love. And he concludes with the Christian's unwavering persuasion, conviction. I mean, these are glorious words. It says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And the idea there is we overwhelmingly conquer. We just don't conquer. We overwhelmingly conquer. Our victory is guaranteed. It is certain. It is yes and amen. And the reason our victory is guaranteed and it is certain and yes and amen is not because of, of ourselves and, 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 and our ability and, and, and you know our uh, obedience and or, 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 or our doctrine and you know our denomination or the, the, the programs we are putting up or the campaigns we raise. Oh no, our victory is certain because of him. Where confidence is in Christ. See, it's not in the government, not in politicians, not in our family. It's not even in our economy. Dear friends, we overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly conquer because of Christ. For I am sure, I am certain, I am guaranteed that neither death nor life Did you hear that? The African, neither death. You know, not this theology of God forbid. <laughs> you know, you die one day, ah, God forbid. <laughs> what God forbid? You, it is appointed for you to die. <laughs> By God. So what will God forbid? You will die. Amen. <laughs> I almost want to say, turn to your neighbor and say. <laughs> <clears throat> Whether it's in life or death. No angels. No rulers, no things present, no things to come, no powers, no height, no depth. Oh, and just in case he's missed anything, no anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, in, from the love of God in Christ Jesus. There is absolutely nothing. 
There is never a moment, dear friends, when we are away from the love of God. We are secure in Him. So I we catechism question, what is our only hope in life and death? That we are not our own, but belong to God. That's our only hope. See, the, the outcome of our lives as believers is not like a soap opera. It's not, you know, some suspense and, you know, you're not sure. You know, you know the way soap operas work. Like, you know, this one is married to this one, but is having an affair with this one. And, uh, you know, they're about to be caught, but, you know, the door is being opened. Two weeks, the door is being opened. Uh, and then, you know, you know, are they going to be caught? Are they going to be caught? It ends. Uh, you know, and then the next week you watch and, you know, they actually sneak out of the window and they are not caught. Uh, and, you know, tune in next time to see if, uh, you know, the, our Christian lives are not like that. They, they are not this, you know, you are not sure what will happen. Maybe, you know, it may, yeah, we may be victorious, but you never know because, you know, and, you know, things are way things are happening and, you know, you know, things are bad. The economy, you know, the, the prices of things are not, you know, the wars and, uh, you know, I just, I'm not sure anyway, by the grace of God. Oh, no, dear friends, the, our, our, our outcome is sure and certain. We will be victorious. Do you have that conviction? Do, do you have that persuasion that in Christ you are secure? Do, do you know the peace and rest that comes from uh, that comes with a un our union with Christ such that in whatever state you are in you have learned to be content it is your confidence in self or in Christ alone do, do you serve this Christ, dear friend, with zeal and confidence? Because you know that his purposes and his plans will not fail. Now they that know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. Do, do you know and marvel in this Christ? Do you long for the blessed hope of his return? Do you? Or are you so rooted here on earth that, that, that the idea of being with Christ forever bothers you? Do you have this conviction that you can say we overwhelmingly conquer in Christ Jesus? See, that's why we sing in Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to, firm to through the fiercest droughts and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, we learned the other day, fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness scorned by the world, he came to save.
still on that cross. As Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. There in the ground, his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. But he didn't remain there. Because then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine. I have been bought by the precious blood of Christ. I love the fourth stanza. No guilt in life. No fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hands till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I will stand. May we stand. In Christ alone. Amen.